So we're going to begin with the film Madhouse made technically. It's a tie-in with Toei, and it's called Door into Summer, or whatever its Japanese name is. Uh, I'm not going to try and pronounce that for now. Now let's have a look at the uh, the opening shot here. Now that is one hell of a hook. Surely you can tell they're going for the art housey styles. This is a long shot from where Madhouse is today. This is shoujo as fuke, with that sort of French tinged style that came with that era. You had those striking shots, you know, the Dutch angles, the spot colors, that metaphorical double shot imposed, red of the rose, the melodrama in the air. And it's not a far cry from the studio, well, the people that created Madhouse's earlier days in Moochie Productions. Now, it seemed to me that in the 70s, Western-style novels and context was a pretty big deal, from Heidi and beyond. And I guess that also was a part in the, the shoujo area. A lot of these melodramatic stories were set in exotic locations beyond the Japanese school that we tend to see these days. Now, The Door into Summer was a manga adaptation, and it was sort of a short manga. This manga in itself, or the manga ka, she was a trailblazer. And you can see many of the tropes of shoujo from the time are here. Possibly the longest legs that you're going to see. Some of the most feminized phases. Shock and awe. Extremely melodramatic practice. And that soundtrack is going hard. Let's not pretend here. This is one of the hardest soundtracks of the era. The composer, known for his works in Macross and later other Madhouse movies, was the perfect choice, I think, for something this extreme. Now, you can hear that. that that's, that's some solid stuff. That's some good stuff right there. In a similar fashion to, again, some of the work at Mushi Productions, it really relies on the music to carry its strange visuals. I don't know how long you'd think it'd be a bit short, but as someone who's read the original manga, it's a pretty breezy read, and they effectively captured most of the essence of it. In a way that kind of makes it just feel like a fever dream, a terrible nightmare that twists down and down until you realise it's actually reality and there's no escaping. We're looking at 73 pages turned into an hour. Though you could definitely see that there is more levity to the comic than there is in the film. The film really just hammers down on how oppressively extreme this is going to get. With its short run time, it doesn't really give you enough to sort of get tired of it. So with our new protagonist having a lot of uh, piss and vinegar over his mother's new lover, he's quick to grab onto that rational game, which is all the rage right now. He wants himself to be a logical free thinker beyond that of love and sexuality. But of course, he's just twice as naive and sort of gets groomed by an old lady in the end. So nice. Oh my god, no. Stop, Sarah. He's just a boy, you monster. Leave him alone! Leading to a downfall which may probably scar him for life and leave him for psychological issues, as in between those we have a sort of Shakespearean play of other boys fighting for control of the rational club and love whoever is interested in particular girls. It's not a story for the faint of heart. It's overt, ludicrous, and oh, oh, so, so extremely melodramatic. And it punches up the lurid detail. So you have director Mori Masaki with Toshio Hirata. Mori became a workhorse for many of the projects that we will see at the studio. And we'll see him a lot later on. We'll get through that. So of course, this manga is part of the Year 24 group. The women who took over the shoujo comics genre and pushed into the taboo and the emotional storytelling to the forefront, removing what was at the time a very male-dominated area. And uh, that, that would seem to be appropriate here because this is a very male story written by a woman. The female characters don't really play too much of a role in it outside of being sort of reactionary to the plot. Catalysts, as you were. 
Perhaps the uh, individuals at Madhouse saw a comparison with that, how they escaped from a bigger company. So it started with those sort of ambitions and then eventually sunk. And they decided as the top creators there, you know, you have your, your Rintaros and your Dasakis. This is one, it's a bold choice to begin with, I'll say that much. It's uh, lurid, heathenistic even, in a way where I don't imagine it will ever get a full release in the West. <laughs> this story is going to end in nothing but misery, and even more so than the actual original manga, it, it doesn't really have a ray of hope left. Pretty much every soul is broken by the end of it. Kurodo. Supposedly, the door into summer had one of the first male-on-male kisses, touching on the edge of shonen i.e. or boy love. The movie sort of uptakes that stake, which was a little more suggestive in the comic, didn't necessarily say it as overtly as the movie does, which goes full on. But that's what kind of makes it a good adaptation in my mind, that it is, while being faithful, it is willing to push it to the max to get across that this is a movie. This is a different than something that would have came out 10 years ago in a paperback. While pushing it forward, it becomes a psychedelic, emotional spiral. You could definitely argue, though, that it's too short to build any lasting relationships with these characters. You're pretty much on the roller coaster with them, with no real knowledge about who they are beforehand, besides small little smidges here. This is a film that's carried by its atmosphere and style. I mean, look at the train scene. This is one that really pushes the animation to the next level. something I should really mention here, that in comparison to the Mushi production works, the animation here is much more fluent and overt when it needs to be and pushes to an extra level, which goes beyond storybook. When it brings the psychedelic love scenes, you know it's, it, you know they're looking at the anorama, you know they're going back to those old days. It's one part psychedelic, one part love life, one part, oh this is, um, this is an inappropriate and horrible life for these fabulous boys. You got those moody color palettes with a couple pop colors here. The postcards that you see in Dosaki's work. You may see things like the leaves or the, the change in seasons being very important to the plot of where we are going in the story from spring to summer to ultimately winter with the falling. Sort of almost like, I guess you could say a metaphor for how brittle youth is and how fleeting it can be, especially in situations like these where they are brought to ten. It definitely hits in the throat, it's blunt, almost cartoonish in its descent into emotional torment. But that's why we're here, right? This is why we want to watch a genre like this, like a shoujo classical piece. If you're into that shoujo style, yeah, this might be the one for you, as long as you know what you're getting into. It is a relic of history, but it is a wild ride, and that's all I can say about it. It looks great most of the time, the story uncomfortable, but somewhat fun and endearing in its own camp way. It boils down to... Not much time on your side, and I don't know if I'll be watching it again anytime soon, but if you're looking into the world of an old shoujo and want to understand where Madhouse began its ride into the complete descent, you might as well begin with the boldest descent. It's cool, it's insane, it's bad, but it's good, and I think after seeing as much as I've shown you, you'll know if you're really in for the trip or not. This is not You're not here to be embedded by the characters' personalities as you are here to see them do things like slap people and jump out of the way of trains. And yeah, it is definitely a mood piece. A mood piece for the adolescents in us all. <laughs>